Hi, I'm Kathy, part of the technical resource team at Kent Scientific. One of our ongoing projects to support customers is to educate users on different practices for anesthetic delivery. Today, I'd like to go over some of the benefits and risks of using room air or about 20% oxygen against 100% oxygen. First, some anesthetic basics. Not every anesthetic is going to be appropriate for every procedure. Some procedures, such as tail biopsy or uh, earmarks, only require animals to be appropriately restrained as opposed to being under a general anesthetic. Furthermore, the end goal of the experiment should be considered. Some anesthetics have known off-target effects, such as liver toxicity. If my experiment is looking at liver function, I will need to take this into account. Finally, and most importantly, are local, state, and federal guidelines. Uh, if your veterinary staff say to keep animals anesthetized while marking with ear notches, listen to them. Uh, make sure you keep them in the loop with what you're doing with your procedures. Going forward in the presentation, we are assuming survival procedures in small non-flying mammals where general anesthesia is needed. There are a few different types of anesthetic protocols that can be used according to the primary factors. Lowering the animal's body temperature results in a natural anesthesia, and it is most commonly used in procedures that, in, that utilize pups. If you need to use it in adult animals, consult your veterinary staff. Injectable agents such as ketamine cocktails or urethane in non-survival procedures are a more commonly used anesthetic. They are easy to use, but difficult to control, including if you need to use repeated dosing to maintain your desired anesthetic plane. For example, if your dose of ketamine only lasts 30 minutes and something unplanned happens during your surgery, you may need to give your animal a second dose of ketamine. The second dose increases the likelihood of off-target effects, including animal mortality. Inhalant anesthetics are often the preferred type of anesthesia. They are easy to use in addition to being easy to control. Although all anesthetics will induce off-target effects to some extent, it is easier to mitigate this with inhalant anesthetics, for example, reducing the anesthetic percentage. They are also suitable for multiple lengths of procedures from a five minute biopsy to an hours long surgery. However, anesthetic gas can enter the environment resulting in researchers breathing it in. In addition to the health and safety concerns, Anesthetic gas also requires some specialized equipment, such as a vaporizer, compressed gas tank, and its accessories, and carrier gas. Whereas the vehicles of many injectable agents are understood to cause minimal, if any, off-target effects, many researchers are unclear regarding any off-target effects of carrier gases used. Interestingly, Although many rodent studies use 100% oxygen as a carrier gas, this does not reflect the composition of atmospheric air. In fact, even during surgical procedures, although there are benefits for giving humans 100% oxygen, for example, divers with the bends or needing um, wound healing, uh, when humans undergo surgical procedures, they are almost always given a compressed medical grade gas, which mimics room air composition. So what could this discrepancy mean going forward if you were using 100% oxygen in rodent surgeries, but this isn't reflecting what humans are usually exposed to? We wanted to get a feel of what researchers already knew about different carrier gases. So we conducted a survey to get a baseline view. Although about half of all researchers surveyed knew you could use gas blends other than 100% oxygen, most were not clear if there were any off-target effects from using different oxygen percentage during surgery or explicit benefits of using different oxygen percentages. Furthermore, although the majority of researchers surveyed did feel that using 100% oxygen could affect translatability studies, they were not aware of any studies that suggested risks, benefits, or other impacts on their research. I do want to be transparent. This is a survey of people coming to the Kent Scientific website. 
So it is entirely possible these numbers reflect a portion of our customer base that are already aware of some of the benefits of different oxygen percentages. However, there, we do see a discrepancy between the amount of researchers who are aware of any off-target effects of care gases and would thus like to provide some more details about the different use, different percentages of oxygen. Uh, first, some of the risks of using 100% oxygen as a carrier gas. In humans, oxygen toxicity has been studied. Uh, the earliest study we could find was published way back in 1945. So this is a fairly well-known thing in human medicine, well known to the point that there is an entire page on it on Wikipedia. Some of the risks of using 100% percent oxygen that we have seen in laboratory animals include complete or partial lung collapse, poor aeration, and damage to alveolar cap capillaries. There is also um, a ventilation perfusion mismatch where some parts of the lung are well aerated and getting an appropriate amount of oxygen and some are not. There's also an increased likelihood of reactive oxygenative species, which can have downstream effects in other organ systems. So, uh, we're going in with 100% oxygen, we're getting more ROS, we're getting injury to the lungs, we're getting unintentional inflammatory factors that may have other effects in systems of the body that we aren't actually looking at during our study. Although 100% oxygen has been linked to increased uh, oxygen saturation and it can be uh, associated with increased survival after surgeries, uh, the increase in uh, oxygen saturation is 98-99% with 100% oxygen and 97% with room air. So using 20% room, 20 percent oxygen or room air, it's unlikely that this alone will be contributing to hypoxia. Look at you and me, we're breathing room air, we're not hypoxic. Breathing 20% oxygen or a oxygen percentage that mimics room air has also been linked to decreased lung collapse. And with that decreased lung collapse comes a decrease in the off-target effects of lung, of lung collapse. So you see less uh, pro-inflammatory factors that are, in, that are influencing other organ systems. We also see increased lung volume and improved vent ventilation and gas exchange. This is suggesting that animals are breathing more normally as opposed to the use of 100% oxygen. Interestingly, many parameters are unchanged when 100% oxygen or 20% oxygen are used. These include body temperature, respiratory rate, induction or recovery time. So it's taking about the same amount of time for an animal to be induced and go under anesthesia and recover from it. The blood acidity and carbon dioxide are not changed and the mean arterial pressure is not changed. These results have been recapitulated in many different species from mice and rats to dogs and horses, even lizards. However, there is always a third option and that is using supplemental oxygen. So not quite as low as 20%, but not quite as high as 100%. This can improve surgical outcomes, such as preventing hypoxia and reducing overall mortality. This has been consistent with both injectable anesthetic and inhaled anesthetic. So if you're giving an animal ketamine and you're noticing them having trouble breathing, you may need to supplement with um, a higher oxygen percentage. Same thing if you're giving an animal uh, isoflurane and they're having a little bit of difficulty in room air, but you don't want to risk the lung damage in 100% oxygen you may want to look at more literature that looks at the use of a um, middle percentage of oxygen. Interestingly, with inhalant anesthetics, the supplemental oxygen is not linked with the decrease in mean alveolar concentration we see when 100% oxygen is given. Finally, I would like to give a brief overview on how Kent Scientific can help you meet your research needs. This will be primarily through low flow vaporizers that can use room air or compressed gas. So why should we consider using a low flow system? First, using a lower flow rate can be beneficial to animals health. Uh, higher flow rates have been linked to both hypothermia and drying of the respiratory tract. So all anesthetics are going to have the off target effect of hypothermia to some extent, but when your respiratory tract is drying, this may um, 
compound effects of the carrier gas that you're using. So especially if you need to use 100% oxygen, you're going to want to try to reduce the off-target effects as much as possible, so you may want to consider the low-flow system. Uh, tidal volume, or the volume of air that an animal is breathing uh, during a normal uh, inhalation-exhalation cycle, is also smaller in laboratory rodents such as mice and rats. While it is partially dependent on the animal weight as well as the pressure of the gas um, being inhaled, for a 10-week-old male animal, mice generally have around a 200 microliter um, tidal volume, so something you can easily measure with a micropipette. Rats have a tidal volume of around 2 milliliters, or something you can easily measure with a transfer pipette. Traditional vaporizers export um, hundreds of milliliters of gas, or something that is easier to measure with a graduated cylinder. So imagine you are a mouse with a micropipette sized tidal volume, have, be having a graduated cylinder worth of air being flushed into your respiratory tract. This isn't something that is necessarily going to be uh, good for the animal's respiratory system. In fact, uh, lower flow rates, in addition to leading to significant cost savings, as well as personal waste gas exposure, lower flow rates can improve accuracy of physiological monitoring and reduce the oxygen cost of breathing. So on a larger systemic level for your institution and your personnel, you're going to be using less ISO, you're going to be using less compressed gas if you choose to use it, less uh, waste gas canisters, producing less waste gas, so you're saving money, as well as reducing your personnel's exposure. We did internal testing with our low flow systems and found a neg negligible amount of um, isofluorine being released into the environment. From an animal level, higher gas flow levels can lead to false positive low and tidal uh, CO2 readings, suggesting that animals are um, not hypoxic when they are, as well as um, the animals are again breathing against that payload that is not natural for them. So remember, it's a graduated cylinder's worth of gas when you only breathe a transfer pipette. So in brief, a summary of traditional versus low flow vaporizers. Uh, traditional vaporizers, in addition to the benefit to the um, aforementioned criteria regarding cost and health, traditional vaporizers require a annual calibration. They have a system of wicks and baffles internally, and they need to be certified and calibrated annually to ensure that they're delivering the correct amount of anesthetic. Our low flow systems are entirely digital and do not need this regular calibration. The low flow system also has a lower minimum flow rate. Um, you may notice that it's still higher than an animal's tidal volume because you do still need to push the gas through um, dead space and tubing. So it, it's more close to the animal's natural tidal volume while also giving enough force to actually move through um, the vaporizer tubing. Uh, it uses less isofluorine over the same amount of time. The isofluorine calculated is for, for the traditional vaporizer is 10 minutes, assuming a minimum flow rate of 400 mils per minute. Uh, theoretically, if you could find a lower flow rate that is compatible with your vaporizer, this number may vary. Furthermore, although a traditional vaporizer always requires a compressed gas source, our low flow systems have internal pumps where they can draw and deliver room air as opposed to um, a oxygen or medical grade air tank. We do offer two systems, the Somno Suite and the Somno Flow. The Somno Suite, both the Somno Suite and Somno Flow um, are digital systems with no calibration required. They can utilize either room air or compressed gas, and they have a small physical footprint. However, the Somno Suite is going to have physiological monitor, monitoring and can also be used as a ventilator if needed. Uh, this is, the Somno Suite, however, does require a syringe mechanism to fill, whereas the Somno Flow can draw anesthetic straight from the bottle. So it's your fancy Lamborghini versus your 2014 Toyota Corolla. Both of them are going to get you where you want, but you might need the Lamborghini sometimes. 
during this presentation, we did summarize some findings from other papers. They are provided here for reference. And I will leave you with my technical information. Thank you.